how to start and maintain an awesome career. This is going to be a very different video than I normally do, which is on electromagnetics or computation or both. This instead is how to start a career. I assume you're very close to graduation and you're wondering what you should do next and how to build your career from there. And that's what I've created here. I will start off and I've laid out a one year timeline. And this is something that I take my research students through in the last year of their time with me. Now, everything I talk about, a lot of those practices sh should be done from the very beginning, not just waiting to the last year, but I get real serious about that during the last year. And a big part of this is personal branding, figuring out who you are, what you have to offer to an employer and why they should hire you and not somebody else, and then trying to sell yourself. I'll talk a bit about networking, developing a professional network, and that's a huge part of career success. I'll give some quick advice on resumes and then a bunch of just random miscellaneous tips for career success. But I will say everything here is not your typical internet advice. I want to give you things outside of what you'll hear on the internet. Some of this will be pretty harsh to hear, but it's honest, it's from my heart and I wanna help you. So let's dive into this. Here's the one year plan that I lay out for my students. And so they start at month one and at month 12, that's when they graduate. So I have them for the first three months work on personal branding and they step through a series of exercises that I'll show you to learn about themselves and try to come up with a statement that they can use to explain themselves and sell themselves. From there, I work on them developing their professional identity. This is after they've already figured out who they are. Now they wanna put the resources online. So if somebody wants to learn about them, well, they can learn about that. So maybe there's a little blurb on my research website about all of my students. And so they get these resources online, LinkedIn, other types of things. And so for the rest of their life, they really should be maintaining that identity online. Then talk about professional networking. This is probably one of the number one things you can do for yourself to be successful. And that's develop a professional network. And this is not just meeting people and collecting names and filing them away. This is nurturing those relationships, staying in contact with these people and how to introduce yourself to people that maybe you're even shy or timid to introduce yourself to. Then we get into writing the resume and you know, somewhere just before month six, we have their resume finished and it's an entirely different kind of format than what you're thinking. And I think a much improved format which sells them much better. And this is something else for the rest of your life, you should maintain your resume. You publish a new paper, you accomplish something new, immediately put it on your resume. So it's always up to date and ready to go. Then searching for a job in the last six months. And that's something that I can help them with a lot, but they also search online. They lean on their professional network, looking for opportunities. And actually a lot of people even approach me being a professor saying, hey, I need students with the skills that you're teaching. Do you have anybody graduating soon? And I can connect dots that way. And I love doing that. And then there's some advice I have when you interview for jobs and how you apply and how you negotiate for the job. For example, never accept your first offer. And this is done for a lot of reasons. One, it builds respect. Uh, two, if you really are as awesome as we want to make you, then you need to make sure that you're getting compensated for that. You've invested in yourself and you need to make that pay off. So it's a respect building thing and you'll probably get more money out of it. That's the one year plan I take my students through. And now let's just dive through all of the details. Personal branding. So first we need to start off with what is a personal brand? And I love this picture of this older gentleman looking in the mirror and he sees this young, handsome dude. And that's really a lot about what your personal brand is. Try not to think too much about what you currently are but what do you want to become? And it has a bit to do with who you are now, but uh, definitely think more about what you want to do, what's unique about you, how you want the world to see you, what you want to be like in the future. That's what the personal brand is. And you're trying to answer the question, why would a company hire you and not somebody else? What's special about you? 
once you got all that figured out, now you want to somehow brand yourself and market yourself. And I put a Coca-Cola logo here because who doesn't recognize that? And there's a very good reason. These big companies, they dump all kinds of money into branding themselves, and that's because it works. And it can work for you if you, do, if you make yourself the brand and sell yourself that way. Now, just as important to all this is maintaining that brand. Once you figure out what you want to do, what's special about you, become what you've set down and maintain that. Now, here's a beautiful garden. But this beautiful garden doesn't stay beautiful. There's probably somebody in there every day picking weeds, maintaining it so that it constantly looks beautiful. So when you develop a brand of yourself, constantly work every day so that you become your brand or even better and make your reputation consistent with your brand. One of the first things I have my student do is called a SWOT analysis. This is something that companies do for themselves a lot, and SWOT is an acronym, and it stands for Strengths, Weaknesses, Opportunities, and Threats. And you can write it in sort of this quad chart format here. So in the first column is everything good, your strengths and what you can improve. And in the second column is all the bad things, your weaknesses and also your threats. So let's just go through this. So strengths. What puts you above your competition? Why would a company hire you and not somebody else? What's special about you? What can you do better than other people? And that all goes under strength. Surprisingly, that's usually the easiest one. Then moving over to weaknesses. And this is something you have to be very honest about. And you don't have to share this with anybody. You can keep this to yourself. But think about things that hold you back. Um, what is it that might stop you from getting a job? Are you maybe not a good speaker? Maybe it's a job that requires good graphics and you're not a very good graphics generator. What's weak about you? And list that and be brutally honest. You don't have to share that with anybody and that part does not have to make it to your resume. You can keep that to yourself. Then opportunities. What are weaknesses of yourself, but that things that you can overcome? For example, you're not good at generating graphics. Well, you can practice that skill, right? You can improve that. But there may be weaknesses that you can't change. Uh, you know, your last name. I guess you can change your last name, but, you know, there are things about you that you're going to have a harder time changing. That wouldn't be an opportunity. This is just what you can do to change yourself. So these are skills you might learn, um, habits you can develop, things like that. And then the last thing is threats. Given that you have all these opportunities you've worked on, you have all your strengths, you have competition, who's better than you? Why are they better than you? And then what can you do about that? Maybe you can add some things to opportunities to compete with your threats. Maybe there's skills you just can't compete with your threats. So you pick up a different skill. So you're more of a complete package than your threat. But you have to know what your threats are. These are the reasons you're not going to be able to get or keep a job. So anyway, that's a SWOT analysis and do this for yourself. And I think you'll learn a lot about yourself doing that. The funnel test. This seems silly, but this is the number one test that I do. And I sit down with my students to go through to come up eventually with their personal branding statement. And this is probably best done by example. And the first thing we'll do is just write down a bunch of things that you're passionate about. After that, we want to describe your tone. How do you go about that? Are you aggressive? Are you shy about it, lazy about it? Are you ambitious? And then really what you need to do for a career is the, at this intersection. The tone is how you're going to do it and outcomes from all this, really your, your purpose in life, hopefully, if you do this really well. So let's step through this funnel test that I did for myself many years ago. So here's my funnel test as an example. Well, the first thing I do is wanna list things that I was passionate about at the time, and I'm still passionate. One is electromagnetics and photonics. Uh, very passionate about that. I enjoy the math. I enjoy the three dimensionality of it, the challenges that it proposes. It's always fascinated me. I always thought electromagnetics was the closest thing to magic that there was. I also love 3D. 
And even for a hobby, I was making 3D pictures, doing the magic eye diagrams. I was doing uh, stereoscopic images. I was doing 3D sound. I was always fascinated by 3D. When I was in graduate school and I was developing electromagnetic simulations, I would always make a 3D version of it, even if it wasn't practical and didn't work well. I was just so fascinated by 3D and how to handle that. It's something that I always did. I like teaching. When I was in school, I started tutoring people. And this started off with the study sessions. And study sessions never worked out well for me because it just became copy my homework or a big social event. And so I stopped using study sessions as a way to study. And I would study ahead of time. I would go to the study session and teach. And by doing that, I was actually able to keep the study sessions focused on, on the students learning. And then I started learning even more and also discovered that I liked teaching and I liked helping people. So that was something else I'm passionate about. And then the last thing was research. I want to solve new problems, very, very difficult problems. And so I looked at the intersection of all that and that helped me figure out what I wanna do when I grow up. <laughs> so what about being a college professor doing 3D printed electromagnetics? And that's exactly what I'm doing. It's at the cross section of all those things. And so my job absolutely fascinates me and I love it. How do I go about things? I am very aggressive. I'm very ambitious in the ideas that I pursue. I love risk. I take on a lot of risk. So the mission of my group is exclusively focused on developing revolutionary disruptive kind of technologies in the areas of 3D printing and electromagnetics. And we do very little incremental stuff. It's all the, the crazy breakthrough kind of things. And that's really fun. Also has a lot of challenges, but that's me. That's how I like to do things. So out of that comes, I probably wanna pursue some kind of high risk, high payoff research. I wanna help people. And so this boiled into what became my personal brand statement, or very close to my personal brand statement, a rough draft of it anyway. And I said, I want to motivate students and to mentor them through high risk, high payoff research in 3D printed electromagnetics and photonics. And so you see how that fell out of the funnel test. And I do the funnel test with all my students and I love it. It's a great exercise. So it'd be a great thing to do on your own to try to come up with this personal brand statement and figure out yourself and how to articulate who you are and what's great about you and what you want to do. The personal branding statement. There's some rules. Your personal branding statement should be one to two sentences. And a lot of times they say your personal brand should be able to be said in one breath. So if you're in the middle of your personal branding statement, you gotta stop, breathe and keep talking it's too long and that's one to two, but if it's three short sentences, that's fine too. The point is it's very short. If it's too long, you lose people. Your personal branding statement should communicate who you are, what you do, and what is unique about you. And you gotta do all this in one to two sentences. That is not easy. So you need to be very concise. You should not use any jargon and you're speaking to a lay person. So you're not gonna use any words that only people in your field would understand. Avoid that and speak to a lay person. So somebody who's intelligent, but isn't in your field, make your personal brand statement understandable to them. Ideally, your personal branding statement is memorable and exciting. And I have some examples. And as far as memorable and exciting, I think my personal branding statement does not do this real well. And it's something that I should work on, I think. So here's my personal branding statement. I motivate students and mentor them through high risk, high payoff research in 3D printed electromagnetics and photonics. And I'm thinking maybe the high risk, high payoff is something that might be memorable and exciting, but I actually don't think I'm doing too good of a job. I don't think that's a memorable branding statement. So I still have work to do. Here's one that I love that I've actually seen a bunch of people use. And I see this on LinkedIn. Uh, signal integrity is a discipline within electrical engineering. 
And when you run signals on a circuit board, if that's too close to other things, you'll get noise and interference, and you really want to preserve the integrity of your signals. And so somebody who does that, their little personal branding statement, signal integrity evangelist. Now that is maybe breaking the no jargon thing because most people wouldn't know what signal integrity is, but I love that personal branding statement. It's kind of funny, it's short, it's memorable. I love that. I use the power of words to increase your online revenue. Short and to the point. Here's another one I love, saving the world from bad content. So clearly this is some kind of web developer or doing some kind of online content. And it's it's funny, it's memorable, it's, uh, it's neat. I like that one. So and maybe these last three are a little bit too short. You could go a little bit longer, but I think these are the best examples that I've found of personal branding statements. And take that for what it is and see what you can do with it. Now, in coming up with who you are, this is a topic that always comes up with my students and they're very hesitant to apply for a job because they don't have any experience yet and they think that they're not worth as much as somebody like me. And I've drawn this picture so many times, I decided to include it in this presentation. So here's a plot. And so you start your career at the left side of this plot and as you age or gain experience, you progress rightward and then you retire somewhere over here. And so on the vertical axis is your job performance, how well you do your job. And so if you have a normal career, you start your career and as you go, you get better and better and better, of course, until you retire and then you just stop working, but you don't stop working because you're bad. You're still a very good worker. And a lot of new students, they're very timid because they know they don't have the experience of the older people. They're not as good. I should put good in quotes as the older people, but that's actually not true. And the way I like to look at it is here's, here's how I progressed in my career. And I'm a reasonably good person. I may not be the best, but I'm not the worst. You'll call me average. And that was my path. I am one person and I am really of, I would say, well, I'm the same person this whole time. I don't know how to word that. So I'm gonna call that line, the line of equal higher ability. It's been me this whole time. Yes, I am gaining experience, but I'm also getting older. And so what's your value to the company? And I would say, as long as you're tracking near this line, you're of equal value. So somebody up here will have the same value to a company or higher ability as somebody down here. Now, why is that? So take somebody near the end of their career and you know maybe they're 55 years old, they're gonna retire in five years, but they're looking for a job. Well, why would a company hire you? Why wouldn't they? You probably require very little training. In fact, you may train them. They're gonna hire you because you know exactly what you're doing and you're gonna go in there and hit the ground running from the very beginning. They don't need to train you. You have a lot of experience. You also probably have a large professional network to draw from. These are the benefits, but there's also drawbacks that are very important. You don't have very many years left with the company. And so they're gonna make a huge investment and maybe not get a big payoff out of that. Older people also tend to have lower energy and in the end could be less productive than a younger person. And that's something else that we have to consider about uh, older people near the end of my career and I, or end of their career. And I can say that because I feel like maybe I'm getting older now. Now, on the other side, you're young, you're starting your career. And if somebody hires you then, you could have many years with that company. Um, you have maybe higher energy and you're more productive. You can do more things within the day than an older person. So those are reasons to hire you. But you're gonna require a lot of training. You're not going to be, you don't have the same experiences as older person. So your job performance is going to be lower. You might do a hundred things in that day, but those hundred things might only add up to one. Whereas the older person might only be able to do five things, but that's five things. And so they can overall produce more work than you simply because they're working out of more experience and they're just, I guess, more intelligence, not the right word, but um, it's happening with better experience and they're able to produce more stuff in the end. I don't know how to say that without sounding insulting, but uh, 
you know, very often older people can just get more stuff done because they can jump right into it. You know, a great example as a college as a thinker, think of a teacher teaching calculus, right? And they want to integrate some function. That teacher could do that in 10 seconds. Well, it's going to take that student maybe a few weeks to learn everything that has to happen about derivatives and antiderivatives and what the integrations happen to happen. So that person that needs training might take weeks to do a task that would take somebody else, you know, an hour or 30 seconds. So if you're a super sharp person and you can operate way up here, well, you're just going to be a whole lot more hireable to a company. And if you operate down here, maybe you have poor work ethic or maybe you're just working outside of where you care about. Uh, your performance might be down here and you're a lot less hireable. But don't think just because you're starting your career that you're less hireable than an older person. There's definite drawbacks of an older person. And I think as long as you're just along this line, that's equal hireability. Anyway, I hope I made sense here. It's really the first time I've shared this particular thing public. This is something that just comes out of my own mind. And anyway, I hope I did a good job with that. Networking. Professional networking, in my opinion, is the number one thing you can do to advance your career. Meet people, nurture those relationships, and help those people. And I can give you a small example from my experience. Uh, when I was working in industry, near the end of working in industry, it was the, the early 2000s and I was writing a lot of proposals. I had about an 80 to 90% proposal win rate. So I'm very good at writing proposals. That's a very, very high number. I joined Academia, University of Texas El Paso in fall 2010. And in my first five years, I wrote or contributed to probably at least a couple hundred proposals. I won one of those. That is horrible, a very, very humbling experience. And so it really made me re-examine how I do things. And I completely changed my business development strategy. And really what it was, was networking. I'm a very shy person. This is the weakest part of my career success. I don't, I, I do enjoy getting out and meeting people, but I find it very difficult. I'm the person that sits quiet in the back of the room at a conference and I don't walk up and meet people. And I really should, because I, I love it when I do do that and force myself to do it but it's not me, I don't do it. But anyway, when I, I changed my whole business development philosophy and I, I stopped writing proposals. I didn't rage quit. I just realized I'm putting a lot of time in that and I'm not winning. So all that time that I spent writing proposals, or I would have been writing proposals, I put into networking, meeting people, showing them what I'm doing. And over time, uh, I'm, a whole lot more successful. I am orders of magnitude more successful pulling in research money now than I ever was. And I write a tiny fraction of proposals than I used to. And it's because of the networking. And also when I do get a project, I deliver miracles on it. I work very hard. I do well for the customer. I have a very good reputation. That's a whole other aspect um, that I think leads to the success that I'm seeing now. But in a nutshell, professional networking is a key to my success. Now, how to network. I like to say, approach this with a give, give, get mentality. If you walk up to somebody and the first words out of your mouth are, hey, do you have a job? Uh, they probably won't give you a job. They don't know you, it's awkward and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's not the way to do things. And I have a great example of something that I did I was at a conference one time and I was listening to a gentleman give a presentation on a topic. This particular one was on invisibility and it was a new way to design and make things invisible. And it was pretty cool and I wanted to work on that with him. Now, had I just walked up to him and say, I love what you're doing, can I work with you? Why would he have done that? I mean, he would have just politely said, hey, you know, you know, maybe we can work together or something, but, but no, I think it just would have been a very polite no. And so near the end of his talk, I realized he had designed some of these invisibility cloaks, but he didn't have a way to simulate them. And he presented a design. I wrote it down real quick. And that night in my hotel room, I simulated it for him. And that's a skill I have. I am very good at that. And I walked up to him the next day and I said, hey, I, I love your talk. 
I saw at the end that you weren't able to simulate some of these, and I here's a simulation. There you go. And I gave to him first, and we ended up working together. We even published a couple papers together, and we're, we're friends to this day. And so I did a good job networking with him, and I, I, was, I didn't have this give, give, get in mind, but looking back on it, that's what happened. I gave first, and then I got from that relationship. So if you want to meet people, don't think of getting from them. Don't ask for a job right away. What can you do for them first? Maybe you go on to discussion boards and you answer questions about circuits or you know, whatever your expertise is. Answer some of the, the beginner's questions. Help them. You know, Eventually, in a few years, they get out into the, the workforce. They may be people that can be on your side. So my networking isn't really – I don't even think much about getting from it. I do get from it now, but uh, my networking is all about giving. How can I help people? And this set of slides is part of that. I don't have to do this, but I love giving. I love people. I love helping people. And eventually this does give back to me. Another example is my research website. I have a lot of other content on my research website other than, hey, I, I want to do research. Give me money, right? <laughs> That's what I want to say. But I put other content out there that can help people. Like I post my classes and I put all my course materials online and work very hard to get that information together in an understandable way with examples and everything. And that's sort of the neon sign. And then that draws people in and then they see my research and they, hey, I see you're doing really cool stuff. And I've actually won research projects that way or met people to collaborate with. So give, give, get, and have that approach to your network. So here's some general networking advice. And if you're a people person, you probably don't even need this. But folks like me that tend to be very shy, I don't just go out and meet somebody new. Uh, this is advice that I've collected. Uh, one, don't just collect names. That's a bad thing to do. Don't like to have a big collection of business cards. So what you want to do is, is meet people and nurture those relationships. Keep in contact with them, even if it's only once or twice a year. You know, maybe you're reading a science magazine and you read an article and, oh, that reminds me of this lady I met who was interested in the similar thing. And you write an email, hey, I was, saw this article, I thought of you, and here's the article. And then that's it, right? You're giving to them and you're nurturing this relationship. If you know anybody your network is struggling doing something, that you have a skill, just help them. Don't ask for anything in return. Just jump in and help them, and you'll feel great about it. So networking is not about just collecting business cards. It's really about developing relationships. These are people. They want to be treated as people. So maintain, nurture your network, um, help and contribute to your network. So where can you meet people? Conferences, that's an obvious one. That's probably the best one. There's all kinds of discussion boards online, probably not as good as conferences. We're people and we like to meet people in person, but discussion boards are also great. And other social media, LinkedIn, ResearchGate, Facebook. I know at a lot of conferences, they'll have sort of the, the format of speed dating, but it's, it's not dating. I forget what they call it, like speed networking. But you sit at a table with somebody for five minutes, you have a quick chat, and then you alternate who you're talking to. If you ever have a chance to participate in something like that, definitely do it, particularly if you're new in your career. And, you know, maybe you talk to 20 people and one stands out. That's one person that you can meet, you can nurture that relationship that you wouldn't have met otherwise. So take advantage of those types of opportunities. Resumes. Okay, I'm about to give you the best resume advice you will ever hear, and you will not hear this anywhere else. If you want to have an awesome resume, do awesome things to put on your resume. No amount of formatting or graphics or any of that stuff is going to make a person look good if they've done nothing that is good. So you're getting good grades. You need to get involved with societies, a whole bunch of things that you can do to make yourself good. So here's a, just a small list. Get good grades. Get involved in student organizations. If I'm looking at a resume and I see somebody 
but literally nothing else going on, I'm going to think to myself, well, okay, this person's smart, but they don't seem too excited about what they're doing. They haven't done any projects or anything. Uh, you know, I want somebody to come work for me who's going to enjoy engineering or enjoy science or whatever it is they do. And so if they're not getting involved with places, that's a red flag to me. And getting involved with student organizations, I would suggest taking on leadership roles. Don't just join and have on your resume, hey, member of the IEEE Society. Take a leadership role. Become the president of IEEE. Become the president of OSA, SPIE, the treasurer, vice president. Organize events for them. So take an active role, and then you can put all that on your resume. And that really will make you stand out above your competition. You can also get involved in research volunteer if necessary. I know all us professors were, were always struggling for money, but if I had a really smart student come up to me and say, hey, I really like what you're doing, I wanna get involved, and I don't need any money, just let me get involved. I'd have a really hard time saying no to that. That's, that's free labor, right? I mean, I definitely want to pay people, but you know, maybe I can get to know that person and when money comes along, they're number one in the slot to get paid. You can also get involved in community service. This looks really good on a resume. Somebody getting involved in community service, like Habitat for Humanity or things like that. This is a person who really cares and is willing to work to help people. I love that. I think that's a great sign. I would also read and just be aware of things. Subscribe to science or nature and just have a general knowledge of what's going on. And so when you're having a conversation on a job interview, you can say, oh, okay, I read this article that talked about that. and. Now you're an intelligent, aware sounding person. So people who are interested and passionate about what they do, they're going to read and be aware of things. So whatever you can do to demonstrate that you're active and interested in your career, even if maybe you have a family at home and you just can't get involved with, with student organizations or research, you could do projects at home. You know, imagine you at home built a robot. And now you're on a job interview and you can say, yeah, you know, I had a, a family and a job and all this on the side. I, I couldn't get involved with student organizations, but I was really interested. So I bought this robot kit and I built it and I programmed it. And it's now, you know, doing my dishes or cleaning my floor, or, you know, something else really cool. Hey, that looks cool. I really like that. That's somebody who's genuinely interested and passionate. Um, the other advice I have, if you want to get involved in graduate school, so not just go on to a job, but maybe you're specifically interested in furthering your career. I would definitely try to get involved in research. And boy, if you at all can, try to get yourself published as an undergraduate. So when you're talking to professors and say, I'd like to volunteer in your lab, and you know, my goal is I really would like to get published. So I would like to have difficult enough research that I'm contributing somewhere. Maybe you're not first author, but you've worked with somebody, you've contributed. That shows some ambition. That shows you're willing to tackle something and solve a problem that not only makes yourself look good to the professor, well, you very likely could end up getting published in the end. So also look for, for professors that actually have a pretty good uh, reputation for publishing. This is a common one, but this is super important, so I'm bringing it up. The six-second rule. When your resume is first looked at, it has about six seconds of time with whoever is looking at that resume. And that seems silly and you don't wanna believe it, but I've been on the other end of this and I'll get a stack of resumes. This is back in the days when we used to print things, and a stack of resumes, you know, two feet high on my desk. And they say, okay, I'll give you an hour to go through these. Well, holy smokes, I can't go through that stack of resumes in an hour, but I can if I only spend six seconds. And even if I, I feel, you know, I'm going to give these these resumes their worth. And maybe the first few, I'm putting five, 10 minutes in it. Well, I guarantee you as I'm watching the time tick or I'm getting bored, you know, I'm starting to spend less and less time as I'm going through those resumes. That's just human nature. And so think about designing your resume with that six second rule in time. And you want to get past those six seconds. So you want your resume to look very professional and very easy to use. You want the information to pop out immediately. You don't want people to have to dig for information because if they do that, they're gonna miss it and just put it aside. You also wanna make, make sure that it's extremely well polished, spelling and grammar checked. If there's an error on your resume, it just of all places where that makes you look bad, that's where it looks bad. So this needs to be the most polished 
and spell checked and grammar checked document of your life. So spend the time to do that. And it's easier if you keep your resume maintained as opposed to letting it collect dust for a few years. And when it comes time to look for a job again, suddenly you're having to add a whole bunch of content and spell and grammar check again. Whereas if you're just adding things sentence at a time, the spelling grammar checking is much easier. So on a resume, there's two parts. There's the first page and then there's everything else. And have that in mind. That first page is the most important. That's where the six seconds is going to be spent. And so you want that first page to say everything about you. Um, and a lot of times at the top of the resume, you'll see a line that says objective to develop a meaningful career and use my skills and blah, blah, blah. And that's, that's garbage. That is a waste of space. Don't do that. Have the very first part of your resume be a summary of you and all the reasons that they should hire you. Also, think about doing something unique to your resume. And if something stands out, you're probably going to get more than six seconds with that person. And they're going to remember that resume. What was that one resume that had that really cool, you know, whatever it is that you've done. But what can you do to make your resume look different and look unique, yet still be professional? Don't get silly here. All right. So here's a very common thing that's at the top of a lot of people's resume where they list their career objective and it's always something like to obtain a satisfying career I get that is garbage don't do that start your resume with a quick and nice summary of all the reasons they want to hire you that should be the first thing so don't do that career objective thing whoever gives you that advice it's horrible advice and don't listen to anything else they say that's not true. They, they might have other good things to say, but definitely don't do that objective at the top of your resume. Waste of space, and it says nothing. Here's my resume, the first two pages. So this first page, what did I do? Well, wow, there's color and sort of graphics, and this does not look like your typical first page of a resume. Yet there it is. That's the first page of my resume. So I've just bought more than six seconds. Hey, maybe that's eight or ten seconds, but you know what? That's a lot of time compared to other people. Now, all the other pages in my resume, they look like this and it, it's boring, but it's well organized and easy to read. And really all this stuff is just backup. All the reasons that you wanna hire me is right here on this first page. And even these top little bullets here. Um, I think I'm a pretty innovative person. I think I think differently than most. I have a pretty diverse background. I think I'm pretty good in business development, and I would like to think I'm a motivating leader. Uh, at least that's how I see myself. And so right up front is why they'd want to hire me, and it's a very different looking resume. And then there's all these awards and things, and wow, okay, hey, this is a pretty cool person. If not, I'm at least going to go to that pile where they're going to look at it in more detail later. So that's my philosophy and what I've done to my resume to make it a little bit different and stand out. This is just miscellaneous tips for career success and not your internet stuff. So the absolute number one thing that I think you can do for career success, well, I've already said it, and it is networking. So we wanna meet people, remember to help people. You wanna nurture these relationships, approach your network with a give, give, get mentality. You're going to give a whole lot more than you can get. I suggest just going with a give mentality. Just think of developing a relationship and think of what you can do to help everybody you meet. And that's the way to approach your network and you'll be much more successful at it. Okay, the last thing was the number one practice. Here's what I think the number one skill is you need for career success. Communication, being able to communicate your ideas and your thoughts and your accomplishments. So there's a lot more to communication than you might be thinking. Yes, there's the speaking and there's the writing, but there's two more things that I'll put down that I think are equally as important. The graphics and visualization. If you're an engineer or scientist, you might have this weird idea. How are you going to visualize that? Or maybe you've collected data and how to interpret that is kind of strange and kind of new. How can you explain this to people? How can you communicate your weird ideas and concepts? And if you become good at graphics and visualization, 
you're going to have a much better ability to do this and a much better ability to show off what it is you've done. And the last thing is professional formatting. And a lot of people, they'll just go into Microsoft Word and just start typing. If they want to make something bold, they'll highlight, they'll hit the bold button. And that is not the way to do that. And in Microsoft Word and all word processing, they have a styles and formatting feature. And that's how you should be formatting things. And it gives things a much more consistent look. And if you just change your mind at the end, hey, I don't like that font. I want to change the font. All you have to do is go into your styles and change the font. And man, your whole document changes instantly. It's very easy. Or your heading style, you can just change it. It changes it all throughout your document. So learn how to use things like Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, PowerPoint, and really learn the features in it. Don't just get in and type and, and think you know how to use the tool. I remember when I was about to write my dissertation and I was asked, hey, do you know how to use Microsoft Word? Well, of course I do. I'm a graduate student. And well, I went and took this course anyway, and it turns out I didn't. And one of the first things I said was, if you're using the bold and italics buttons to change your formatting, you do not know how to use Microsoft Word. And they were right. And I learned all about styles and formatting. I learned about how to insert links so that numbers and things can automatically update. It made my life a lot easier and it made my documents look better. So all of those skills I lump into communication. So practice all that, speaking, writing, graphics, and even just formatting. Now some miscellaneous tips. Here's an odd one. Very often as you build your career, you're looking for jobs, you're going to need letters of recommendation. Write your own letters of recommendation. So you're actually going to be able to do a much better job writing that letter than anybody else because maybe it's a teacher that had you a few years ago in a class. They may not remember you a whole lot. They could look back and say, okay, this student got an A in my class, must have been pretty good, but they may not remember all of the interactions or things that you did in you, that class where you went above and beyond. So by writing your own letter of recommendation, it's going to be much better. I also recommend writing those letters of recommendation before you even ask that person because you're going to ask them and writing a letter of recommendation is a lot of work. It could take a couple hours to write that letter of recommendation, particularly if they don't remember you or you send them your resume and they got to look through your resume. That's a lot of work and people are super busy and they may come up with some excuse or whatever and or maybe they just don't ever respond to your email. So you'll get many more yeses from people if you say, hey, would you mind writing a letter of recommendation? I think it will be really meaningful coming from you. And I already have a draft written. Wow. Okay. That's something I could just take, just, you know, work my magic on, edit a few things and it's done. And I am much more likely to say yes. And in the end, it's a better letter. So write the letters ahead of time, have them ready before you even ask. And chances are you're getting letters of recommendation from multiple people. Don't give them the same draft, write very different sounding letters for each one and make it sound like it's coming from them. Maybe one of them worked with you when you were a leader in a professional society. And so their letter is going to emphasize your leadership abilities. Maybe another one had a really difficult class you had and you got an A in it. And they're gonna talk about you from an academic perspective. So make your letters as different as you can because if you send everybody the same draft, well, that's gonna look silly and pretty obvious when the, the employer gets you know, three letters that all look basically the same. They'll, they'll know what happened there. Here's one that I like. If you want to accomplish things that others do not, you must act and think differently than others do, right? If you're thinking like everybody else, why is it you're going to accomplish things that other people haven't already accomplished? Because you're thinking just like them. So think different. You, you don't have to conform all the time. It's okay to stand out. And here's some cartoons I found that I thought are really cool. Uh, so Snoopy and Woodstock and being weird. It's just a natural side effect of being awesome. And the other one, if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. And, you know, we, we're subject to peer pressure and we don't want to get picked on by our peers and we want to conform. We don't want to stand out. When we get a new job, we don't want to communicate that new idea we have because then the other person in the room that wants to try to be the smartest person there is going to bash you. And it works. And they do look like the smartest person in the room. That's what's really frustrating. 
And so there's all these reasons that we just want to sort of conform and not stand out. And I'm telling you, don't do that. Be polite, but it's okay to be weird. Think differently than others do. Now, if you want a career of mediocrity, go ahead and act like everybody else and you'll be cool. You'll be loved, but you're going to hit that glass ceiling. And I hope you don't complain about hitting that glass ceiling. Fail your way to success. That seems like an odd one. I would like a career where I can push myself so hard that I fail at least half the time. And what I try to do is engineer how I approach things such that if I fail, it happens quick and cheap, right? Let's say I have this big glorious idea that'll change the world. And there's this one little aspect of it. And if that aspect works, then pretty much the whole idea would work. If that aspect fails, it's the whole failure. I'm gonna focus on that little aspect first. And so hopefully I can understand if that big ambitious idea is gonna fail or be successful way early on with little money and little time investment. Then I can move on to my next crazy idea and try to get that to work. And then that probably fails. And you might fail 99 times and that hundredth one is where you're successful. Well, guess what? Just don't talk about the other 99. Say you did this, it worked and you look like a genius, right? <laughs> So fail for the right reasons. Don't fail because you're lazy. Uh, don't fail because you didn't try. Don't fail because you weren't ambitious enough. So fail for the right reasons. Fail because you've pushed yourself so hard. Find your own path. You know, very often we hear, we study about Steve Jobs and all uh, the Elon Musk, all these rich, successful people. And we start thinking, boy, if I don't act just like them, I'm not going to be successful. And that's completely not true. I think if we put Steve Jobs in Elon Musk's shoes, he'd fail. And Elon Musk in Steve Jobs' shoes, he would have failed, right? I, I think people find their own path and that's okay. Be you. You are good enough to be uber successful, no doubt. You just have to try. You got to apply yourself. And so don't feel this pressure to be like others. Don't read the habits of Albert Einstein or you know, previous presidents and think you have to do those things to be successful. Now, I think you do have to work hard. You need to be willing to help others and those types of, those types of things. But you look at somebody successful and you read, oh, they only slept two hours per night. Well, I think you could be plenty successful sleeping 10 hours a night. Yeah, maybe you won't get as much done, but you're gonna have to find your own path and you can be successful. So. Uh, don't be paranoid about repeating habits of others that you just don't think are you. Operate outside your comfort zone. Take on things that make you nervous, make you uncomfortable, push yourself, right? I recently visited Thailand and one of the things I did was try Thai boxing. And well, they were just doing an exercise thing. No, no, I wanted to get in the ring with a Thai fighter and that's what I did. Now that's weird, right? But I'm pushing myself. I'm constantly putting myself into difficult, awkward situations so that I can grow as a person. Um, if you're if you're taking on a new job and you're not nervous about it, then you're not pushing yourself hard enough. You're not learning. Uh, every time I write a research proposal, I'm scared to death I'm going to win it because I just said I'm going to do all this stuff that holy smokes, it's like super hard. I have no idea how I'm going to do it, and I'm scared to death and that's what I do all the time. If you ever feel qualified to do something, don't do it. Do something harder. Otherwise, you're not going to grow as a person. Here's a quote by Pablo Picasso that I absolutely love. I am always doing that which I cannot do so that I may learn how to do it. And that is that is me. There, there's the personality type that they want to learn everything about something before they try it. And instead, I'm going to get in and try it and then learn it. So if I'm going to learn how to swim, I'm just going to jump in the deep end of the pool and either I die or I learn how to swim. And that's, you know, maybe not the best approach for all things, but it's definitely what I do. So I learn by doing. And I think a lot of people are that way, but not everybody. And as I mentioned, if you're not that way, don't be paranoid. Stick with what you do. Be you because you're going to be you better than you can be me. And I'm going to be me better than I could be you. So find your own path. But I definitely recommend pushing yourself and operating outside your comfort zone. In my experience, 
I see people holding themselves back way more than society does. And some of the classic questions, I'll talk to electrical engineers and they say, you know, I'm really interested in, in robotics or farming or, you know, something that's not related too much to electrical engineering. And they think they're not going to be able to do that because they're getting a degree in electrical engineering. And society doesn't put that on you. Only you put that on you. As an example, I got my PhD doing nanophotonics. My research right now is predominantly 3D printing of electronics. That is completely different. Maybe I got some strange looks along the way, but you know what? I don't care. I did it, and I think we're doing better at it than anybody else in the world, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of my team. I didn't let my lack of preparation or lack of apparent qualification stop me. You know, I'm a smart person. I'll figure it out. And that's really what an education is, honestly. It's not about what you know. It's about your demonstrated ability to get it done anyway. I like to say there's no such thing as experts. They're just people that get it done anyway. And that's definitely me. Here's something else for career success. As you get into a job and as you progress, uh, things don't get easier. You are gonna get more and more and more piled on top of you. And this will be difficult for perfectionists because, well, everything you do needs to be perfect. Well, when you get so much and if everything has to be perfect, you're gonna be working 25 hours every day and that's impossible, right? And you're gonna die. <laughs> so you have to learn to do good enough and you need to learn to allot a certain amount of time. Okay, I can allot three hours to this task. You do the absolute best you can do with that three hours. Yes, you could do much better if it were six hours or a day or a week, but you know what? You don't have that time. You have three hours. My first job, well, actually my first job was with NASA, but uh, after that I worked for Harris Corporation. And I remember I got involved in a proposal and there was me, I was a new grad, had a bachelor's degree, and there was a, a big high up senior scientist and we had to do some writing for the proposal. And this senior scientist wrote about a page of stuff and I wrote about a page of stuff and I looked at him. And what that senior scientist wrote was good, but just okay, I mean, just just good. And I looked at mine and mine was awesome compared to that senior scientist, just absolutely awesome. And I thought to myself, man, I must be a genius. I am gonna kick butt in this world. Well, fast forward and, and I, I learned really what had happened. This person was given an hour to write that page. I was given a week, right? So of course mine was gonna be a little bit better. And that's, that's just life. And you know, that person did the best he could in the time that he had. And I'm sure he could have done miracles had he been given more time, but later in your career, you just don't have that. You have to do huge tasks in very little amount of time. So learn to do just good enough and it will get you through that. I love this cartoon. Um, so you got this scientist talking to somebody at a board, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but there's one place where a miracle has to happen, right? <laughs> and so their guy says, hey, I think you need to be more explicit. And people laugh at this. And whatever the idea the scientist is talking about is pretty much discounted because a miracle had to happen. And I think a huge element to my success is I have the ability to put black boxes around problems and not worry about finding solutions to it. There's been problems I've solved that required multiple miracles to come together. And I couldn't do them all at the same time. I had to work on one at a time and just sort of have faith that I was gonna find an answer to the next miracle. And in the end, when it's all delivered, you look like a genius, but in fact, it's not that, it's more bravery or something. You're, you're willing to put black boxes around problems that just pretend you have a solution to one and be willing to work on the other. A lot of people, they're just not willing to work on anything unless they have answers to absolutely everything. And well, I think in business, that's probably a good approach, but it's going to limit what you can accomplish if you operate that way. So avoid habits and peer pressure that limit your creativity and performance. Peer pressure is a huge one. And I used to be subject to that. And somewhere along the way, uh, I think the more negative people are towards my ideas, the more motivated I get that I'm probably on to something. <laughs> so, and I just kind of laugh off things and I feel perfectly comfortable expressing a completely crazy, dumb idea in the middle of a crowd. And, and maybe I'm at a point in my career where I can get away with that 
earlier in my career, even though I'm expressing the same idea, it gets beat on a little bit more. I think maybe now because I'm a little bit more senior, people just think, oh, he must know what he's talking about. And I don't. I'm the same person I've always been. I have the same stupid ideas. Uh, I'm the same person. I'm just older and maybe more people believe me now. But at some point, I was able to let go of the whole peer pressure thing. And and I enjoy getting bashed for my crazy ideas. So I'll leave you with this. This is the absolute number one thing that you need to do. Help others. So get involved in campus organizations. And this does good things for you, too. It gives you leadership opportunities, but it also gives you a tremendous opportunity to help others, tutor others, advise others. Get involved in philanthropy, Habitat for Humanity, donation centers, uh, work a, a, a food line or something like that. This is the number one thing that we should do. You know, we're, we're all on this earth together, all at the same time. Um, it's a it's a special time and, and people are special. And the more we can help each other, the more we're all going to be successful. So I want to thank you for listening to this. This has been a very different type of video than I normally make. It wasn't technical at all. It was all about career success. And I hope I managed to give you some wisdom that maybe you haven't heard before. I really tried to stick to advice that you won't find online, not the typical stuff. So thank you very much, and I wish you great luck in your career.